My name is Alex Berger. I'm a principal TME in the Meraki product organization. And uh, joining me today is Nico Dero. We're here to talk to you about the expansion of our Catalyst 9300-M portfolio, uh, including a bunch of uh, new things. So let me hand this over to Nico real quick. All right. Thank you. And I'm very excited to be here. And today we're going to be talking about the Catalyst 9300M. So this is um, where, you know, what we want to do at Cisco is like take the most popular enterprise grade switch out there and marry it to the, you know, the largest cloud platform out there. And what we want to do is bring the best of both worlds together. So this is more than just taking our shiny boxes and putting them in the cloud. This is being able to leverage the power of the cloud with some of the best hardware capabilities out there. So we've always been asked for this unified platform, right? Where we have the programmability of cloud, we have the flexibility of the catalyst, and, and you know, be able to expand into multiple environments where customers usually had to choose between Meraki or Catalyst. And that's not the case anymore because it's not an either or, it's an and. And this is where we have that flexibility and the power. So Going forward, one of the things we wanted to do is explain a little bit about why dashboard. Now, for those that have used Meraki in the past, you know some of the capabilities of it, but I wanted to cover about more than just the configurability, right? It's the, the visibility of dashboard, but also the ecosystem that has been built around the platform, right? We have 300 plus ecosystem partners around our API environment that have been building applications and use cases around it. Not just about you know, uh, uh, telemetry, configurability, automations, but also uh, you know, serviceability. If we want to tie in with a service now, you're talking about taking your entire infrastructure from you know, your small locations to your large campuses and having that under one dashboard and the, and the power and the flexibility around that. And the Catalyst is just a, another uh, component of our rich uh, portfolio and dashboard. So what does this mean, right? So if we talk about some of the, the fundamental components of Meraki and what does it really define the, uh, the environment with is, is the, you know, day zero is one of them, right? It's that simplicity of being able to order a catalyst and, and while it's on the back of a truck, you know, you get that order number and you claim it in dashboard. And once it's in dashboard, you can configure it. You apply it to a network and it inherently knows what access policies are at that network level. You know, the configurations are there. Break fix is just as simple as day zero. And the idea is, you know, leave your console cables at home because it's the intuitive way of the only way to configure that switch is through dashboard. And that's, that's the power and the simplicity of, of the day zero deployment. Um, and beyond that, it's, it's how do we manage it on the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And firmware management is, is a great example of how we've expanded our capabilities. You know, Meraki is a, is a dashboard, is a, is a platform that is a perpe a perpetually iterating uh, our capabilities. We first started with firmware capabilities and firmware upgrading where you upgrade an entire site at, at once. We've expanded that into gra more granular control because as customers start leveraging Meraki and you, you know, using Catalyst, you get beyond a two to three switch environment. You're talking about customers with 70, 100 switches and that's not something that you can easily upgrade at once. So, you know, enhanced staged upgrade is one of these features that can benefit from, from a Catalyst environment, being able to classify switches into the access distribution core level and be able to upgrade that over, uh, different, over time with full granular uh, control, right? Uh, verification and validation, understanding that there is no other way to upgrade a switch than through Meraki dashboard. So you remove a lot of the complexities around having to have a TFTP server, download the right CCO, make sure your flash is clean, right? That is all taken care of um, by dashboard. So you get a focus on what really important to the business and, and building on the platform rather than having to manage and you know uh, keep the lights on. So day zero, day one, we've just talked about provisioning and management, but what about the visibility? And this is where you start getting the, the benefits of dashboard. Um, on top of the capability of the platform, being able to look at the NBAR application visibility, the 1500 plus applications, seeing it at a high level, right? Being, being able to see that single pane of glass across your access points, your switching, your SD-WAN, uh, even your automation, right? With ServiceNow integration and ticketing systems, you have that ability to both see, you know, problems in the environment, problems as they show up, but also understand the reactions or the effects of changes being able to understand what's going on in your environment, creating those policies, enforcing them, and then realizing the results and seeing that in real time is very, very powerful. 
all from the comfort of your uh, your seat, right? Not having to go on site or, or roll a truck to that location. And that's what we wanted to do is take that simplicity and and empower you without having to remove the capabilities of the of the platform. This is a, a simple day in the life of a troubleshooting, right? Where if if you haven't seen before, a packet capture is a great example, right? We talked a little bit about a cloud PCAP earlier. Uh, this is something that has been traditionally hard to do on a catalyst, uh, especially if you don't have the right management platform, you'd have to save the capture locally, TFTP it off box, pull it in, fire up Wireshark, say no, I don't want to upgrade Wireshark because it always happens, and then figure out what's going on. And that's usually, you know, you 30 minutes past, you know, uh, the point of incident. So how do we short circuit some of that? And how do we automate some of that? And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So this is where you can take a look at the client. You can see where it's connected, the path as that client flows through the network and understand where it may break down. Do we have layer three connectivity issues, DNS, understanding where along the flow it breaks down, what applications are in use. If people are complaining that they have service and they're doing you know, voice, you wanna know that their problem is with voice and not you know, Instagram, right? What is, what is business mission critical for the environment rather than, oh, you just want some really good internet. Um, we've also brought in you know, the capabilities to uh, you know, dig down deeper, right? Look into the event log, grab the packet captures, and uh, as well, all the alerting that ties into this is, is the same that you're used to with Meraki. So talked a little bit about why Meraki, now let's talk a little bit about the hardware and what we just announced today. So we, last year, we released nine SKUs. These are nine 9300-Ms. These are born Meraki switches that were uh, feature parity with or, or feature capable with our existing MS390s, we introduced another 15 switches this morning. Um, if you look here at the dark blue, this is what we announced for the We Are Shipping now. Um, last year. And the light blue and the green on the right, the 9300Xs and 9300Ls uh, are what announced today and will be orderable on the 13th. So this is rounding out our portfolio, and, and we wanted to uh, add capability thing for things like SFP28, 25 gig, as well as 100 gig uplinks, um, and as well as PoE plus, uh, UPoE+. Plus. Uh, there's been a big demand in the industry, especially around the IoT, OT environments, where we want 90 watt PoE. We want to be able to, we want the capability to power more devices and have more uh, uh, you know, flexibility on the life cycle of the switch. So digging a little bit into the 9300X. Now this is something that we're really excited about because this is a, uh, a new fiber aggregation switch that has 25 gig uplinks capabil capabilities, right? Uh, you've got the 24Y 9300Xs as well as a uh, you know, combination of the 9300X 48s and um, you know, 48 HXNs for the, the highest uh, multi-gig UPoE plus port density available per stack. And this is all, uh, you know, connected via, you know, Cisco's, you know, pedigree stack wise and stack power capability. So for one terabit of backplane is new to this platform, but it is also backward compatible. So what's great about this, as well as the 9300 regular dash M's is that they are compatible. If you have already invested in 9300 M's and you want to add a 9300 X to that stack, it is backward compatible. But of course you can also go full stack and get that full one terabit. And of course, it's you know very resilient. So you can lose any stack member here. You have um, you know you're not going to take a data plane hit. As well as you can lose power supply. We have a shared power across all of this, and it matters a lot when you start talking about the leveraging 90 watt PoE. It becomes critical when you start having failures. You don't want to have thing, lights turn off or access points go down. Machine emission critical environment. On top of the 9300Xs, we've also expanded the portfolio into the 9300L. Now these are uh, the same feature capabilities of the 9300, but a much lower cost model. So this allows you or the customers more flexibility in where you can deploy these, where a 9300X may be a little bit overkill for a small remote office. The 9300L is an excellent solution to kind of have the same capabilities expanded into those environments. And of course, um, you know, optional stacking as well. So the fixed uplinks as well as the optional stacking um, allows for greater flexibility for customers that want to deploy catalysts and make sure they're ready to do a larger deployment or scale up as they as they you know replace switches. 
So the one of the biggest components of the 9300X is the 90 watt UPoE. This has been asked for in the environment or by customers, mainly for simplification. You know, we've seen customers deploy separate IT and OT stacks uh, where you know OT is looking for you know power distribution and they kind of want to have it segmented from enterprise and corporate traffic. Because you know we don't want to have these incredibly complex security rules isolating you know door locks and lights from corporate laptops. Now we've seen that convergence uh, with the 9300X because we both have the power capabilities as well as the segmentation capabilities with adaptive policy, making sure that we can create these simple rules that say you know your LED light switch, sorry your LED light is not able to you know talk to your printer. Right? There's some very simple rules we can enforce, and that segmentation is inherently in, uh, applied throughout your infrastructure. And of course, the visibility of dashboard, right? It's great to have all this capability, you deploy it out there, but I want to know what's my power usage on these devices over time. How can I, you know, schedule these ports to go offline when they're not in use, as well as knowing that, okay, turn the lights on when there is traffic in the environment. These are some of the closed loop uh, automation things that you can build into the platform because you both have the visibility into what's going on in the environment, what applications are in use, um, and you know, and then of course what uh, what we have deployed as far as power. Um, we brought up this a little bit earlier, but I also want to reiterate because this is a great example of how we can start bringing in other uh, products uh, to to augment the visibility of these platforms. Before you'd see you know your Catalyst switches in in dashboard or your Meraki switches in dashboard, see pa fan failures, power failures, but why, right? And that could be you know, AC failures, it leaks in the environment, and being able to tie in our MT sensors into the this MS switch page allows you to see environmental values outside of uh, just the inside of the switch, right? So from uh, understanding the power usage, how much power it is, remote rebooting if you want to, it adds that uh, flexibility. So just to summarize, this is one of the reasons we invested in the Catalyst platform, right? Is for that, you know, the platform resiliency. We've got the stack wise, right? So you can lose any single stack member and still have uh, your data continuity, right? Stack power for losing power supplies, shared power across that stack. So you know confidently start deploying, uh, you know, mission critical POE devices in the environment. There is a significant resiliency built into the platform. Design and resiliency, right? Why go with the Catalyst versus uh, competitors, right? We have the baked in adaptive policy for that segmentation that you know is inherent and not have to be micromanaged. You don't have to worry about ACLs. You can classify devices by context and have that enforced uh, across the industry, uh, across the network. And of course, the operation resiliency, right? The, the visibility into the environment. What is going on? How do I fix it? And then has those fixes actually made a change where I'm seeing improvements, right? That closed loop automation and that closed loop operational efficiency is, is what is needed to, to build into the larger uh, deployments. So I want to talk a little bit about Dash M, right? So now we've bought the 9300 Dash M, or maybe you've uh, purchased the 9300s before. Um, how does this work? And this is one of the things we've uh, added is the ability to migrate back and forth. So if you have an existing 9300, and you want to go into the full management mode of, of Meraki, you can convert existing Catalyst switches into Meraki and vice versa. Meanwhile, we've also simplified licensing, where if you have existing licensing on either the DNA or Meraki platforms, you can, you can convert it as well. Uh, under licensing under Meraki, we've also simplified it because we didn't want to do the per model binding of the license. So we have a 9300 license in a 24 port or 48 port model and then enterprise or advanced. So it's technically four uh, permutations of licensing to simplify that. And that's software licensing, RMA, hardware, and that makes it a lot easier for customers to, uh, to manage and order. And that being said, um, I believe I am gonna be passing this back to Alex to talk a little bit about some of the capabilities beyond the hardware. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, so I just want to go over a few things that we've been focusing on, uh, you know, taking advantage of the Catalyst platform. Uh, first and foremost, if you've seen me present here before, I talk about adaptive policy pretty consistently because it is, uh, you know, in my opinion, an industry leading, uh, you know, security strategy that allows for micro segmentation and doesn't require that you have to re-IP your network, have to, you know, do a rip and replace or do a greenfield deployment to be able to start getting 
a lot of uh, you know granular security controls over the clients that are connected uh, to the network. And not only do we build adaptive policy to provide that micro segmentation within Meraki, but also to allow for integration across Cisco. So if you have environments that have uh, TrustSec or SD access, uh, we're able to you know, integrate and share that context without having to uh, you know, build really costly uh, out of band control plane connectivity. Uh, on top of that, with the Catalyst portfolio, we have uh, network-based application recognition, uh, which is usually is called NBAR. Uh, in this case, we take that telemetry and that data and we bring it into dashboard uh, under our traffic analytics. So if you're familiar with our MX platform or MR platform, uh, we've had NBAR built in. And with the uh, you know, 390 and the 9300, uh, we're able to capture that same information and uh, get that into dashboard to give you a much deeper look into what clients are doing. Now, we don't just keep that traffic data to ourselves. Uh, we did build out uh, AVC NetFlow and encrypted traffic analytics so that you can also export that information to uh, platforms like Secure Network Analytics or Cisco's XDR, uh, which is a combination of a lot of different uh, technologies like uh, what used to be called StealthWatch Cloud um, or Secure Cloud Analytics, allowing us to take that uh, sensor information so that you know, we can start giving better analysis on uh, events that are happening in the network, client behaviors, potential malware, and be able to try to uh, proactively um, stop that from causing issues. Now, one feature that we are building into CS17, which is the more or less our Catalyst Switch uh, software version, is uh, Radius uh, caching. So if you ever heard of critical authentication, you can connect a client in, and if the Radius server is not available, we could you know, authorize them into a specific VLAN based on the you know, voice or data domain. Uh, with caching, we're actually able to store the last result so that when the Radius server responds, store the information for that client. And if we lose connectivity to the server and you unplug and plug the client in or they went to sleep and woke, we can reapply that same set of policies so that it's a little bit lower impact than uh, you know, bouncing around with VLANs or trying to um, you know, figure out what port to plug into that maybe doesn't have a security policy. Uh, we are allowing for configuration of how long it will cache, like, you know, in hours. So if you wanted to do this for a day, two days, um, you can do so based on the, you know, outage window or how, how long you expect there would be an outage. In some cases, we've had customers say that they need, you know, two or three days because they've had consistent WAN outages in the past. Now, carrying that in, uh, when we deploy adaptive policy, what we're doing is really giving you the ability to take advantage of Cisco's TrustSec uh, all through uh, our cloud managed platform. So when you go into dashboard, it's all organization level policy. So you don't have to define your security policy on a network by network basis. Uh, at the network level, you just classify endpoints. And then we can then use that to share context from uh, MR, MS, MX, and even into, not going back slides, uh, even going into um, you know other uh, parts of the portfolio within Cisco. As I mentioned, um, or I've mentioned in the past, uh, with MS-17, we're also bringing in our MS-130 portfolio to be able to operate within that adaptive policy environment as well. Um, another key piece, we have to have ways to classify endpoints. It needs to be flexible. And so we are bringing with our CS-17 release uh, VLAN to SGT maps so that if you have um, you know, single-use VLANs or you need to have a fallback classification mechanism to getting an SGT on an endpoint, um, doing so in a really easy manner using our VLAN profiles that uh, we launched, I think, like a year and a half, two years ago, where you'll be able to go in and even down to a switch-by-switch -switch level associate a specific VLAN to an SGT. Now, a lot of this is built you know, to help Meraki become you know, as powerful as possible from a security perspective, but it also allows for us to better integrate with the rest of Cisco when we look at um, you know, security operations and functions. Um, when we integrate with ICE, we actually are able to have ICE sync policy uh, from you know, into Catalyst Center or even to Dashboard, which allows us to have a kind of a common policy framework where we use that SGT to um, you know, share that context between potentially what we'd call domains or different parts of the network, but also be able to uh, kind of leverage the same policy outcomes so that whether you have a large number of branches deployed with Meraki and maybe your campus deployed with a standard or traditional Catalyst environment, we're still able to have that same policy, that same behavior 
uh, across the different parts of the network so that you don't have to worry about managing you know, different types of security policies and constructs in different parts of your network just because you bought cloud or you bought uh, you know, traditional um, uh, like catalyst center deployment. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up with uh, thanks. And is there any questions or comments? I have one question. SGT is kind of the first journey to go for more zero trust. Are there any plans for the future to have something more user identity based? Uh, so that kind of this, uh, let's say, zero trust story goes until the Meraki switch. Yeah. yeah so. You mean like a little bit more like unique or down to like the user level of like exactly. A... So we do have a couple. Uh, I think you may have heard earlier from like the Secure Connect folks, and there we're working on a lot of different ways to layer in security. So with adaptive policy, it's really a focus on you know building unique groupings that we can kind of expect that we'd put the same policy on across uh, you know all the devices in that group, but. If we layer in security, we can start adding in you know, a little bit more granular controls over uh, user by user basis, but not necessarily with adaptive policy as the only like tool. Um, we'd probably layer in things like some of the aspects of Secure Connect and some of the other um, you know, functions we've been building. I think the long term thing, Microsoft is a bit owning with Entra ID the market. You want somehow to have the Entra ID integration in long term. Yeah, so. yeah that's fair. Yeah. It, I can't speak necessarily directly to that one, but uh, I, we are looking at ways to continue to like expand and get more granular, um, you know, functions out of it. It's available. Uh, it will be available in the future. The integration between uh, SGT and uh, SASE uh, Cloud Firewall uh, policy. Yeah. So we are working uh, together with the, uh, the SASE folks, especially like on the Secure Connect side, and we are identifying ways to, uh, you know, better push integrate the integration. Uh, a little bit more holistic coverage. So, just a high-level question. So, obviously, Cisco was asked, or Cisco Enterprise Networking Networking was asked to come and present their products today. What we see is Meraki. What's behind that? I mean, is the is there a philosophy philosophy behind putting Meraki forward and first over Catalyst? question at all. <laughs> I'll say, I mean, for, for us, we all work within the uh, Meraki, you know, business entity. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we would we'd probably talk to you about that first. Um, I can't really speak to the, uh, the ordering per se, but I think within Cisco, we're really looking to try to unify platforms. So um, this is one of the one the big ones we're working on right now. I don't know if that answers your question per se, but a little bit. OK. <laughs> So this is the main point too. I mean, I'll expand on that. And hopefully you've seen some of this now for a while from us. Um, that unification really is kind of the aim through the best of both worlds. You know, uh, the cliche, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to avoid saying. Um, but the, like Cisco has this incredible hardware legacy, um, you know, with Catalyst. Um, Nico showed us some of the Catalyst 9300M stuff, even the accessories. We've talked about that uh, at Cisco Live this week as well, even with some of our new switching platforms. We are building new Meraki switches, but even there we've kind of said we should reuse power supplies, optics, things that Cisco already has that it doesn't make any sense for us to rebuild from day one. So we're really, you know, bringing the teams closer together and leveraging like the best of everything. Um, so there's, it's not necessarily that Meraki has been, you know, put forward because anything other than we, you know, our dashboard experience is one of the things we do well. Um, and we're trying to leverage the best parts of Cisco as well. So it's just more joining, um, you know, I think we're thinking of ourselves less as separate entities as, as the days go on. Yeah. I think it was a year ago that Meraki Wireless and Cisco Wireless converged into a single BU, right? And so do you see that happening in the switching realm as well now with the single hardware, two operating modes and Can you speak to that one? I mean it's certainly not something that we'll say won't happen. Okay. Um, I will tell you like behind the scenes that like our teams are working more closely with those, you know, the people who identify as Cisco teams closer and closer all the time. 
Um, you know, Alex as a principal TME is not focused on switching specifically anymore and like has some very um, robust relationships with those people. I, we all do really. So, I mean, we are separate still like in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like hierarchy or organizational structure, like officially, but there are a lot of tight, uh, working relationships right now. So, I mean, it, it's not something that is happening tomorrow, but it certainly could. Thanks for the frank responses. Yeah. Do you see there being a future having having like a, a Meraki, Meraki fabric? A future having a fabric? It's funny. You said a future and then pause, and I was just going, yeah. yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Next future. question. Um, who wants to talk about fabric? What do we think about fabric? So I can say one of the things we're focusing on right now is bringing the Catalyst to the Meraki platform, right? So once we have the Meraki uh, inherent behavior like nailed down, right? Because it, it is a significant platform. We plan to expand the capability because we can't, we're not going to bring a Ferrari to a, a bumper car game, right? It's We're going to be able to leverage some of the capabilities of that hardware. So the idea is we want to first you know, have the hardware out there, the same capability and, and operational flexibility you want, and then build onto it, right? So um, what we want to do is, is you know, not try to boil the ocean day one, but start layering in, in that capability. We're starting to see that with the adaptive policy, the security, making sure that customers can use it uh, and get benefit from it. And then when we, we have the, the, the right opportunity, hopefully the next text field day, we'll start sharing some of that with you as well. So. so since Dollar Delegates pulled the thread on organization and kind of the cooperation between groups, talk to me about the journey because Meraki has been part of Cisco for quite some time now. So you've seen customers transition from that, and Meraki itself has transitioned from a SMB play to more of a mid-sized company play. But when we're talking about enterprise uh, solutions, Cisco, you know, still primarily owns that brand. Talk to us about transitioning customers from Meraki to kind of the, the bigger solutions. You talked about updating, you know, several dozen or up to a hundred devices at one time. What happens when we're talking about two, three, four, five hundred devices and people outgrow Meraki? Um, I'm glad you asked. But first, it, it is Cisco Meraki, right? So it is the, the Cisco cloud platform. And, and we see customers not pick either or, we're seeing and. So at the enterprise level, we see a lot more Meraki adoption because it's it's the, you know, they take their corporate locations, they build the best of the best SDA fabric, and they want to take that and expand it out to 8,000 locations. Now there's there's resource requirements, right? And, and it's not just if they had unlimited monies and people, it's, it's about personnel as well. So it's how do we take uh, the solution that we've designed at Cisco and expand it into that edge and then Meraki fits that bill. So we see enterprise adopting a lot more Meraki because it can play in that up. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see enterprise to Meraki, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking Meraki customer that has grown up right. and go enterprise. That's a much more difficult transition because I don't have the DNA, pun intended, uh to say that oh all of these processes that i did not own because i outsourced it essentially to cisco meraki i now have to adopt these processes because meraki doesn't really that traditional meraki approach doesn't so how do you help these customers basically scale into the cisco portfolio versus cisco customers original cisco customers adopting meraki I mean, I, I think this is this is a great example of where the Dash M plays, where you know you've got traditional Meraki customers deploying Meraki switching, and now they want to start leveraging some of the advanced capabilities. And it, to make that jump directly into Catalyst is probably pretty you know uh, intimidating, especially when you start talking about you need to have a you know configuration management, uh, syslog, receiver, all those components are baked into Meraki. So it's it's easier to adopt a Catalyst in the Meraki mode because it's all contained in dashboard. But we are also supporting third parties. So if you want to export NetFlow and crypto traffic analytics to those uh, X, you know, XDA environments, you can, or you can have that capability in dashboard. But the idea is they can deploy one catalyst or 100,000 catalysts. I mean, we have 2.5 million uh, switches online. 
we have the scale. Now we just need to add the capabilities as they grow up to be able to have that segmentation that they've they've seen and known and loved with, you know, Catalyst Center and SDA, but they want that in the Meraki environment. So I think it's it's a, it's definitely a growing environment or a growing product set, but uh, hopefully they see uh, some value in that. So Meraki is going more and more into enterprise or? Ad? Absolutely. I think I think if we were, uh, you know, if we talk about siblings on on-prem and, and cloud, I think we both learn from each other, right? Where uh, Meraki does some things extremely well, but we we want to, you know, learn from that capability. And that's how we can move more upmarket and, and solve some of those problems for our customers. But it's not one solution that solves everything. So there's, that's the that's the options we're giving our customers where you can pick and choose and you're not wrong either way. Previously it was as SMB. Yes. And it's growing more and more to enterprise. Uh, for uh, Meraki is not just SMB anymore. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, we've been we've been focused on trying to ensure that we we have been focusing a lot on ensuring we work towards building features for customers based on like the solution or the you know solution for the problem they have uh, more than just building features and so. Um, I'd say probably over the last you know eight plus years, we've really been trying to focus on uh, more advanced use cases, uh, streamlining just how you manage switches in the first place, um, so that yeah, it's a lot easier to adopt whether you're a small mom and pop shop or a you know really large uh, corporate environment. It's amazing uh, because I attended uh, Wireless Field Day a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, when there was the acquisition of Cisco uh, by uh, Meraki. Got my first uh, MR uh, mm -hmm. stuff on uh, on the desk, and that changed a lot. So seeing the growth from SMB into enterprise is going very fast. Well, maybe yeah, that's a it's a cool story to hear, and we hear um, you know from time to time. I'll point out maybe if it's interesting that all of us kind of came from similar backgrounds as well, where we were all like very hardcore Cisco deployment engineers who had the same experience with Meraki. Um, and so now, like certainly for the Meraki switching product team and people who have been through that team, uh, we're all bringing that experience and going, we know what that, you know, what the, that hardware legacy in particular can do. And we really love Meraki as well. So we're almost like the the example of that customer, right? Who knows what's capable um, and how awesome it can be if it can be simplified and a little intuitive and we can focus on, you know, the outcome more. So hopefully that's what you're seeing in some of the things we're building. I mean, easy uh, to deploy and easy to install. It's like a couple of years ago, like it is for now, because it's still the same. Absolutely. Which is still growing from SMB into enterprise. I have a security related uh, question. Yeah. On traditional switches, not only Cisco, a lot of those, we have some vulnerabilities. Then people just don't patch their devices either. They don't have the engineers or it's too hard to do to schedule and so on. So with this cloud approach from Meraki, I would like to hear from you. Yeah. If let's say something critical would, come up, you have the capabilities to patch all the customers or to enforce something faster or do a configuration change for the customer. I would like to hear your approach, how this is changing vulnerabilities that are maybe found in the system and how you react for those, maybe even in behalf of the customer. Yeah? No, that's a great question. Uh, so actually including like our monitoring product, you know, we had recently had some vulnerabilities that cropped up around the web UI. Uh, we proactively alerted like every customer we saw that was on a vulnerable version, and also uh, we're running the HTTP server, uh, and you know more or less provided guidance like turn these things off. Uh, but we were able to proactively reach out and indicate, hey, this is this, this could be very bad. Uh, when it comes to like managed uh, our managed switches, we do have the ability to you know patch uh, firmware, also proactively alert and provide like a a bump to the next uh, you know, firmware that does have that vulnerability taken care of. Um, we do have a, like an entire team that's focused on when there are vulnerabilities, how we message them correctly, ensure that we've not missed anything, right? So uh, we try to think on that last one. I mean, I think before it was even announced, we'd got a list of customers and we had um, proactively emailed if they were in a state that um, you know, could be potentially vulnerable. So I don't think we intend on changing. Like we're going to continue to iterate on that, and I think, hopefully, yeah. 
For uh, me as a security person, I would love to see something like, I define my change window. I say every Sunday, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., you're good to go, yeah? And when something critical comes out that just the cloud knows, okay, this is now, let's say, in the wild, people are actively exploiting a certain bug, yeah? Then the the patch is rolling out without me taking care of it. Mm -hmm. It's just provided by by you guys. Yeah. Add something to that. Um, because that's a really interesting uh, thought. One of the things that we are actually actively working on quite a bit is um, ways to make upgrades easier and faster. Um, so Meraki has always done like a pretty good job of kind of making it automatic. But maybe something that we've learned from that over the years is that automatic doesn't necessarily mean low impact or easy to do. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm sure you've all experienced like we've had customers where the notion of upgrading you know, thousands of switches all at once at the same time is quite scary. Um, so things like staged upgrades, which is newer for us, um, are uh, starting to go down that path of like, what can we do you know, if we're if we're not going to do it completely automatically for you, what can we do to make it easier for you to say yes? I will upgrade every single day of the week you've given the opportunity. So things like being able to break up you know your network into um, smaller like fault domains, you know, or upgrade um, some switches at once and and then others later, which is what stage upgrade does, right? So you know if we can identify for you the affected switches. You know, and you can just upgrade those ones today. It's a lot easier than saying, oh, I have to run an upgrade that affects thousands of switches, even though most of them aren't vulnerable, right? Uh, we're working on some other things about like how to reduce the maintenance window so that like maybe we'll pre-download ahead of time so that when the times when, when you say you want to upgrade at, you know, 2 a.m. on Tuesday to your example, that is exactly when the outage window will happen. So everything, your maintenance window suddenly gets shortened a lot, right? Yeah. So removing those barriers for you to kind of be able to schedule that upgrade um, is one of the big things we're focusing on, uh, which I think opens a lot of doors for the things you're talking about. It's interesting because Dashboard does have a setting today in Dashboard to say your preferred maintenance window is Tuesdays at 2 a.m. Yeah. However, when we schedule those upgrades today, we're still quite careful in that we kind of send you the emails that in two weeks we'll do it at Tuesday at 2 a.m. for you. Um, and what you're talking about is a lot more rapid, right? And so there's a few things we're working on to like reduce the risk um, to enable those quick changes. And I think everybody has, back in the days, years ago, horrible story where an update failed and everything was down. And I think the confidence level of the people, when these updates just work, they are tested and have a good procedure and so on, it will grow and then people are more to opt in for automatic updates. Yeah. So you don't patch and there are vulnerabilities you get owned. So we don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. That is with a lot of the things we're doing health upgrades, that idea of creating like strong trust is one of the things we also talk about a lot and that, you know, fewer questions about what we're doing in the back end and more of us being very blunt about what's happening so that the trust is there.